Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on this Friday for our Crucible Virtual Artist Talks. I hope you are all doing well in a week that has been very deeply moving for us across the nation as we all fight for justice, anti-racism, and systemic justice for all in our country and across the globe. Thank you for your continued fight in our, Trump, in our, our walk towards freedom and equality. Um, my name's Alyssa Stone. I am the Director of Programs at The Crucible in Oakland, California, and I am very excited to welcome you all um, to our virtual artist talk today. Uh, this is going to be our final virtual artist talk for the time being as we focus on relaunching operations at The Crucible in Oakland, um, including some re-envisioned youth summer camps, which are on sale now, and forthcoming adult programming, which we are very excited to welcome people to that. Uh, if you've joined our artist talks before, welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome. We are so glad that you've joined us today. Pop over to the chat and give us a hello and tell us where you are watching from. Um, we are going to ask that all of our attendees remain muted for our artist talk today. Uh, you will be able to add questions into the chat box that I will read aloud for our artist, Rob. Um, so pop over to the chat, tell us where you're watching from, and add any questions you would like me to ask of our artist this afternoon. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with The Crucible, but in case you don't know, uh, The Crucible is a nonprofit organization based in West Oakland, California. Since 1999, The Crucible has been an important cultural arts organization and community in the Bay Area. We serve more than 5,000 students a year, work with over 45 local schools, offering classes, workshops, and site visits, and have the pleasure of introducing so many students to the transformative power and confidence building experience of making art. Over 20,000 people each year interact with our classes and programs, with 64% of the young people we serve receiving financial aid to participate. For many, The Crucible is the industrial art school in the Bay Area, known for high quality teaching and a vibrant artist community. However, since COVID-19 erupted in our area, The Crucible has had to cancel or postpone more than 230 classes and programs. We are working to bring some of the magic of The Crucible online, including these virtual artist talks that you've joined us uh, for today. We are going to get through this and we are asking our community to support us by becoming a member, purchasing a gift certificate, donating online, or buying art directly from our faculty to help support their extraordinary work as well. We encourage you throughout the talk to send questions you have for Rob to us in the chat box. You can do that publicly or privately, and I will ask those questions aloud to Rob. Um, and I want to send a couple of thank yous and acknowledgements out. A big thank you to all of our staff and faculty at The Crucible who've continued to work hard behind the scenes, uh, getting us ready for our relaunch of operations. A big thank you to our marketing duo, Natasha Von Canal, Director of Marketing and E-Commerce, and Kathy Nylon, Marketing Associate, who helped to make these artist talks run so beautifully and smoothly. A big thanks to Susan Mernet, our Executive Director and fierce leader of The Crucible, and to our CFO, Renee Ventimiglia, and Director of Operations and Studio, uh, Studio Operations and Facilities, Kua Patton, um, and all of our staff. Rob Nuring has been involved with The Crucible since the early 2000s. He initially traveled cross-country from Chicago to take a glass casting class, but was reconnected with welding upon his arrival in the East Bay. As an undergraduate, Rob received his BFA for Inter Arts, which included studies in theater, dance, and sculpture, his first exposure to welding. During his first months in California, Rob began filling his extra time as a Crucible volunteer. Since then, he's held staff roles like studio manager and director of programs and has been a member of our faculty for more than a decade, in which time he's taught more than 50 classes. As the sole proprietor of Rusty Noodle Studios, Rob creates his humorous welded sculptures using 99% recycled materials, letting the materials dictate what they will become and emphasizing the personalities of ordinary objects. Rob's sculptures are in galleries and part of private collections throughout the US. 
Since 2015, he has donated a number of pieces to our annual Fire and Light Soiree and Art Auction, helping to raise $12,400 for the Crucible's arts programming. Please join me in a warm virtual welcome to Rob Nuring. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Rob. I'm so excited to talk with you today and so glad that you are our featured artist for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see some old friends out there. So it's great to see you. <laughs> Let's Let's jump right on in um, and talk about how you were first introduced to welding. What attracted you to this art medium? Um, well, I have to say it, it took a while for me to get into welding. I took some classes in college, but um, uh, any of you who have taken uh, welding classes in college, you probably know they don't give a very in-depth view of it. So. I actually, it was more a means to the end. I do a lot of, um, or I used to do a lot more mixed media sculptures. And I had a piece that was, um, had a metal base to it. And uh, my professor said, oh, you should weld those pieces on. And I said, I don't know how to weld. He said, John, show them how to weld. <laughs> Hour later, I was TIG welding. <laughs> and it was on a old steel uh, uh, drum from a food food drum. So any of you who know TIG welding know, of course, that I didn't do very good welds. But uh, the project actually held up and turned out cool. But um, it was just more of a mean stand than anything. Do you come from an artistic family? How did you get your artistic bone? Sure. Um, all my siblings have uh, some part uh, artistic uh, from music to dance to food um, so everybody has a little bit my father um, actually but is really my inspiration uh, he's kind of the ultimate craftsman renaissance man and he can read a book and do it um, he uh, actually I'm sitting here now in Milwaukee in his wood shop uh, that he had for many years but he could brick lay um, stained glass windows, do almost anything. You know, he even actually uh, found a block of wood and carved uh, Noah's Ark out of it and all the characters. Um, really um, awesome person. And I remember in Cub Scouts, actually, when I was about 10 years old, he led us in paper mache and that hooked me. And uh, all my life I've been hooked since then in art. So you have focused your artistic, incredible talents in the welding world. Um, for those of us who are not welders ourselves or maybe a little less familiar, could you give us a very quick rundown on the types of weldings and the type of welding that you mostly focus on? Sure, sure. So uh, oxyacetylene is actually um, a very inexpensive way to kind of start welding and there's an advantage to it because you can also cut and manipulate metals with it. Um, MIG welding or metal inert gas is almost like a, a hot gluing for welding. You pull a trigger, a wire comes out, electricity comes through it and it will melt the two metals together. Uh, TIG welding or tungsten inert gas, um, that has a tip on it and it's about the size of a nail um, and that will direct heat to a very small area. So it's kind of like the Cadillac of welding and can join to similar metals. And then arc welding and arc welding stick or STAW, um, that is kind of what I focus on. Really um, a lot of the equipment I think we were having a choppy signal for Rob. Let's see if we can get him back and, and uh, check his signal again. Rob, I think we lost you for just a few seconds there. Would you mind going back and telling us a little bit again? Sure, sure. Um, so I'm not quite sure where you lo lost me, but arc welding is actually my focus. Um, Perfect. And it's uh, pretty industrial, uh, used for bridge building and uh, building structures. And that's the, the medium that you focus mostly on. Is there a particular reason why arc welding really speaks to you? Sure, well, 
it's one that um, I actually uh, kind of started with when I went to the Crucible. I took a class from Don Carlson and Joe Brooks, and they were great instructors, and um, I really enjoyed taking it with them. And uh, it's a little bit rougher and heavier, but again, the machinery is so inexpensive, and, um, and I like the look of the weld. They're a little rougher of a weld and kind of bulky, but it kind of matches in with found and reclaimed materials. Perfect. And in just a moment, we're actually going to have a chance for Rob to show us some of the incredible works that he has behind him and a special work that we're going to show. Um, but as you kind of think back on your earliest introductions to welding, what were some of your early learnings from welding that you carry with you? Did the welding come naturally to you or was there a learning curve that you had to experience? Definitely a learning curve. I, I was really lucky, again, to have uh, two fantastic instructions, instructors. Uh, they were both boilermakers, Don Carlson and Joe Brooks, and they were super supportive. Um, what you do in arc welding is you have a, a stick welding, you have a stick that's coated in a flux, and it actually melts down. And so when you're first learning, you have to keep kind of moving it closer to get in. And, it, and it's a real hard thing to get used to, otherwise you'll break your connection with the metal and the arc and it will stop and you'll have to start over again. So it takes a while to get used to that. And then also really simple, but I was not a natural. You have to make little circles. And I actually went home after my first class with a pencil and just kind of ran them on. Definitely building up some of that muscle memory. Um, I think, oh. It's not a natural um, at all. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing that. I think we've got a little bit of a choppy signal for you. So that's just something to be aware of for our viewers. Um, we might have a, a bit of a choppy signal, but we'll figure it out as we go. Um, and Rob, I may ask you to repeat little bits of what you've said, just in case it seems like it's been lost. Um, sure. So you actually have a background in dance as well in it, as in industrial arts. Could you tell us about your experience as a dancer and how has your background in dance influenced your welded art? Sure, sure. Um, again, I started out um, kind of more in theater and, and I was doing theater and I, I love doing theater and all of a sudden I decided, discovered musical theater and I cannot sing at all. <laughs> so I started taking dance classes so that I could participate in musical theater. And um, it just went from there. You know, I um, took tap and jazz and then ballet to strengthen myself and then modern dance company classes. And um, I ended up, my first uh, paid position was with the Milwaukee, Pennsylvania Ballet as in, in the core and, and that's definition of professional is getting paid even though it wasn't full time. And then a modern company, um, Dance Circus, where I traveled all around uh, the US and did different performances. I ended up actually, uh, uh, one of the last performances I did, I actually uh, joined a Ukrainian group and danced on, uh, in Japan on national Jap Japanese television. So it was, it was really a fun experience. Um, the study of motion, you know, and dance is what I try really hard to incorporate in each of my pieces, that movement, you know, and kind of the anticipation of movement, because of course you're working with normally just uh, pieces of metal that aren't going to move too much on their own. So um, I think that's really important to me and kind of balance and form and, you know, human beings when they stand, they very rarely just stand still in one place. They're in motion all the time. So it's just where are they going and how do you translate that into a piece of metal? Brilliant, thank you. Let's talk more about your particular work and viewpoint, your artistic viewpoint, which I am totally in love with. I have, 
uh, bought many of your pieces and given them out as gifts and they always just excite everyone's heart when people see your pieces. Um, so you mentioned that dance had a strong influence over your welded sculpture. Um, tell us more about the themes that frequent your work. Sure, sure. So again, I, I look and I really look a lot at um, expressions that might, uh, might appeal to people. And um, like um, embarrassment is one that <laughs> comes back and forth. And you know, the movement before embarrassment and kind of hiding in, in embarrassment. Uh, also, um, you know, uh, fright and anything kind of like just an outright emotion. I really, um, um, uh, really make it work. Um, I, I, I really try um, to do it. Sometimes I do do specific people um, when I get commissions, you know, so I'll kind of go for that. I, I had a lot of different commission pieces that were based on uh, performers. And um, usually I try to incorporate something uh, additional to it that relates back to their own artwork too, you know, and bringing that in. So, yeah. Um, metal is very strong and unwavering, it seems, but your pieces are anything but rigid. How do you add movement to your metal pieces so they don't look or feel rigid? Sure. Um, so I think a lot is about geometry and math and physics. Again, that balance is really important that it looks like it's about to move. Um, I also have a big advantage working from found pieces. So a lot of times I'm looking at metals and thinking, what does this look like in shape? And they're reclaimed metals, so they could be uh, twisted or bent or broken or anything. And I'll use that kind of form to figure out what I'm gonna make and go from there. Um, it's, it's kind of a fun way. Also, I use the oxyacetylene torch a lot to manipulate the metals and give it a shape, you know? a shape that has that motion, that has that movement. Um, a lot of times you think of a piece of metal and it, it's almost like looking at a stick figure, you know, when it's just laying there. It's fun to create it and change it into a shape that's actually has mo movement in it. Your pieces really excite the imagination. Also, they look like they could all be in one big circus family together. Um, and they have such a whimsical feel to them. What is your intention behind creating your whimsical world of metal sculpture? Sure. I, you know, I hear, I hear a lot of artists say, oh, you're not very serious, you know. And, and Rusty Noodle Studios was really creative to, to bring out just the fun, you know, to avoid all the darkness of the world. And, um, you know, in college, I just want to tell this story. In college, I actually had a, uh, my very first professor of sculpture. And I, um, I, um, I started out and I was in college and I'm thinking, okay, uh, I've got to do something cool. It's my last project in my first class and I'm going to do a snow globe. Now I know you see these huge snow globes all the time now, all over the place, but back 30, 35 years ago when I was doing this, there weren't any. So I actually made this, I was gonna make this big snow globe with Christmas scene in and a house that was, um, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, all set up with the lights and the snowman out front. And I brought it to the instructor, which I had to do the professor and said, you know, this is what I'm thinking of doing. And she's like, that's a great start. Now, why don't you start it on fire and burn the house, you know, in the globe? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's not me and that's not my idea of Christmas, you know? So I did do another project that had a little more depth to it, kind of in thought. But Rusty Noodle Stu Studios is not about the doom and gloom. It's about the smiles and the love from the pieces. And we're very glad for that. Got to have a little levity here and there in the world. Um, so where does the name Rusty Noodle Studio come from? Um, that just was one of the questions in our chat box and great minds think alike. That was literally my next question as well. Tell us where that name comes from, Rusty Noodle Studios. 
Sure, sure. I really can't take credit for it, actually. Uh, it was my husband, Harry, who came up with the name. We were talking about, um, you know, my initials are RN. And again, it, it's Rusty Noodle is all about the light. I do do darker pieces, but I, I, I always think, you know, um, I needed to have that separation between Rusty Noodle and myself. So um, I, I, I said to Perry, I said, you know, what can we do? You know, RN will make people think of a nurse, but, you know, I sign my regular pieces, Rob Nearing, and what will I sign my other ones? And he came up with Rusty Noodle, you know, always my inspiration, my support, you know, um, and funnier than heck, you know. Um, he then a couple months later, after he came up with that name, he said to me, if we ever get a divorce, I'm going in competition against you, and I'm going to name my studio Krusty Poodle Studios. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> I adore Perry. He is such a delight. <laughs> um, thank you for that anecdote. It's very, very cute. Uh, we are going to take a look at a couple examples of your work. Um, it's so lucky you are in one of your studios now, so we're actually going to ask you to hold up a couple pieces um, that you can talk with us about. So I'd love for you to introduce a piece, tell us a little bit about its vision, the materials used, um, what's the intention behind the work? Sure, sure. So this first one I'm showing is... Uh, She's a little bit of a traveler here. You can see she has a little purse and a little suitcase there, you know, kind of all lined up. Her hair is actually made out of old bike spokes and her skirt is actually an old gear. Um, bolts for the arms. And then you can see her feet and her footprints is actually a heart, you know, so. Um, so she's just kind of waiting to go on a trip and ready to, ready to travel. When you create a piece like that, uh, you know, you've talked a little bit about the materials speaking to you about the piece that it's to become. How do you know what you're, what you're going for, who the piece becomes? Sure. Sometimes when I start, I have no idea. <laughs> I kind of get an idea from the piece that, oh, this is going to be a skirt. Um, it's funny, I have all the time when I'm welding, I have like these aha, mo aha moments, you know, that I think, oh, I can do this with this. And then it becomes kind of part of my vocabulary and I kind of move on. But a lot of times I'm just starting with the piece and letting it kind of tell me what it's going to be. And I don't draw it out or anything because I want, you know, as I add it to be able to change and evolve based on what I find. So. Would you grab another piece that you'd like to tell sure, us about sure. and, and give us a little uh, insight? This one actually uh, is a little bit smaller and it um, is actually one of my COVID pieces here that I spent a little bit more time on. You know, you can see this is actually a vegetarian pig for any of vegetarians <laughs> out there. And um, there's a little bit of movement, you know, little pig on the spigot, kind of that you can kind of turn and kind of make the throat around. This is actually part of a much larger piece, you know, and um, had a lot of fun doing it, you know. It's a little kinetic. Things where you go, oh, that's how I can do that, you know. Yeah, a kinetic sculpture. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I want to just highlight, I've got my Rob Nuring piece right here with those heart feet, and yeah. I love this little piece. Um, and Rob's pieces are so cute and so much fun. I look at this and it just brings such a huge smile to my face. Um, so you too can have a little piece of Rusty Noodle Studio, um, a small cute figurine to bring a smile to your face. Um, we're going to look at one of your larger works now um, called Nine to Five. Uh, Natasha is going to very kindly um, add the image to all of our screens so we can take a look. So this is a, a really large piece, actually. It's probably a little bit taller than I am, which isn't saying much. I'm not the tallest person in the world. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about this piece and how you came to creating it? Sure. And again, this piece is called Nine to Five. And um, 
I've been interested in kind of stairs and architecture for a long time. Um, so I found that angle iron in a scrapyard and it just kind of, you know, it kind of just said stairs to me. So I started um, uh, doing this and I've actually done a number of stair pieces with different angle iron, iron I found. But this particular one, you know, I started just building the stairs from the angle iron I found and then, you know, created the flow. And you can see here the movement um, that I talk about, like with the spiral staircase and just how the whole piece kind of swirls around. Um, again, all of the pieces, and that's how come there's different shapes for like the supports and stuff. I just found pieces that I, I've got, gotten over the years, a brake drum for the base there um, on the bottom. And the clock actually is uh, garage door springs for the the circle circle of the of the clock, you know. Um, this one actually is a little more interactive, and the little characters um, are actually on magnets, so you can move them around to different places. Um, I sort of thought of Escher a little bit on this piece, so you can actually even hang them upside down in different spots or on the sides of the, the square tubing. Um, this is the window washer, again, made out of all bolts and nuts and just found pieces. And um, it's just whatever I find and think, oh, I got to do this. I've got to make a little phone. Her hair is made out of bike spokes and poker. I also thought a little bit about kind of the age of this piece. You know, this was back in the 60s. So I made the female actually doing the present, presenting and the receptionist on the bottom, a little male. So kind of changing up the gen gender norms in it a little bit too. Nine to five is a very loaded phrase, right? We've got Dolly Parton's nine to five. We, we think about nine to five in a lot of ways. So even through your your metal sculpture, you are speaking uh, to a larger cultural message as well. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the processes that you use to create this kind of upward spiral staircase motion? Well, it, it, it isn't easy for sure because I'm doing a lot of just holding and tapping um, to get it started and kind of getting, um, <laughs> I'm not a very good, not very good at measuring and pre-cutting things. So, um, uh, but I think it adds a little bit of charm too. Again, it, it's um, like the welds are rough and the piece is a little bit on the rough side. I kind of like to have that little bit of a organicness and kind of uh, natural. You have a very strong relationship to reclaimed materials as well. Could you tell us what kind of brought you in that direction of using reclaimed materials as, as the bulk of your uh, um, sculptural kind of meat. Um, you know, what, what does that speak to you about? Sure. Well, when I was a child, like I said, I had that paper mache class. And, you know, all through my childhood, I would do these things, which is scraps that I would find, you know, whether it be uh, the bottom of a meat tray or anything. I got to college, you know, and I was taking theater and dance, and then I decided, oh, I'm going to take sculpture too. I love sculpture. And I thought, I'm going to get new materials, you know, and I started out, you know, in college classes, you know, buying things to make things. And very quickly, I learned I have absolutely new, no interest in getting new materials. I love finding things that are kind of discarded and putting them into something and changing it completely. So it's just, it's really an exciting process for me um, because so much is discarded, you know, and we're in really a disposable uh, world now. And so it's just really fun to uh, kind of change that around. 
We're going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about your relationship to the crucible, which you have such a long, deep relationship with. Um, and I just want to remind our viewers that if you've got questions for Rob, pop them over into the chat and I will read them out loud. Um, we've already hit some of the questions that people have posed, but there's one that we'll hold um, to our Q&A portion. But if you've got questions that you would like uh, Rob to discuss, add them to the chat and I'll read them out loud towards the end of our talk today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your relationship with the Crucible. You have a long history with um, our nonprofit organization. Um, a fun insight that I mentioned a little earlier, Rob is my predecessor at the Crucible, a former program director. Um, could you tell us how you were first introduced to the organization and how you found your way to teaching at the Crucible? Sure. In 2001, actually, um, actually in probably 2000, I actually quit my full-time job in Chicago. I was working at a candy company and thought, I don't really want to do this the rest of my life. And I thought, I'm going to do art. And I quit my job. And um, I gave them nine months notice, actually, because uh, they kind of asked me to stay and kind of hold out. And I did. And I got a great bonus for it. So, um, but... Uh, I started looking for classes and um, a lot of the places that offer classes um, that I wanted to take, I actually wanted to take a glass casting class and uh, to do a project. And a lot of the schools offered like a week long program for a three grand and you would live there and everything. And um, I found a crucible online and I thought, you know, I can go for a 10 week, <laughs> 10 week long class, pay rent, even in San Francisco and stay, you know, uh, for, you know, a few months and have a place to live. And I really have nothing really else to do because I've just quit my job, you know? <laughs> and so I decided to do that. Um, and, you know, I walked into the crucible and fell in love. I got a tour when I first got there and just fell in love with it. Um, and, you know, I started volunteering right away. You know, Michael hired me um, in November. I was supposed to go home uh, to, uh, ten, to, after 10 weeks, but I stayed um, to November and I was gonna leave in three days. And uh, basically, uh, uh, Michael hired me on the roof of the new crucible. And um, I said, well, I'm going home, but I'll come back and <laughs> work here. And, and um, I've worked there since, you know. Um, Teaching, I've always loved teaching. And in previous jobs, I, um, I, as a dancer, I actually taught a lot of dance classes. And then uh, I went on to be a corporate, uh, a corporate uh, instructor, instructor at my previous jobs. I was a pork truck trainer. And I also um, developed and taught a recycling program at a company I worked at. So I really love teaching. My mother was a teacher. And um, so, so it was just kind of a natural transaction, uh, transition for me. You know, I, um, you know, I was, and it started with welding for sure. And I, I've done some concrete work too, classes and other things. But, uh, you know, I had the experience with welding. Don and, uh, Don and Joe needed a TA for their class. I volunteered and started TAing, I TAed a few times, and then I, I got my own class, you know, and I've loved it ever since. And students have loved you ever since as well. It's always fun to see you in the studio teaching youth and adults. I love what you do with our students. They make the most incredible story full, story full to pieces in your classes. Um, could you tell us what maybe is one of your fondest memories of a Crucible event or program that you are particularly proud of during your time at the Crucible? Sure. I, you know, it's strange because it's, it's simple, but it, it's so relevant, I think, to the Crucible is the tours. You know, when I went in and had my first tour and walked into that space and saw the potential of that space, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store. And you know, giving those tours, and I would give them twice a week in my positions, uh, different positions almost throughout uh, my career at the Crucible. And every single time, you know, and there'd be someone 
there who would just be like, you know, just amazed. And it just was so heartwarming to be a part of an organization that inspires people just that much by being. I mean, people would come from Australia and all over and their friends would say, you have to see the crucible, you know? And um, we had students from Australia and Singapore and different things coming in because of just the awe of the crucible. And we still do. You open the gates to the international crowd and an international fandom and they still come from every corner of the globe. So um, it's awesome. So you've shared with me a little bit more of an embarrassing story of a memory during a Crucible performance. Would you be willing to share that story with our audience today? Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, being a nonprofit, they do a lot. And, um, one of the very first performances in the new space was an opera called Didus and Aeneas. And um, there, it was the San Francisco Opera Company came over and did all the singing. And um, one of the acts was actually a belly dancer. And um, Michael asked me to help, and he knew I was a dancer and had a dancer background, and asked me to help carry out uh, the belly dancer onto the stage for her performance. And it, it was short, but I said, yeah, I, I can do that, you know? Um, it was only after that that he told me that I would have to take my shirt off to do that. And so that was a little bit embarrassing for me uh, in front of the crowd. And so. The things we do for our art, right? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Um, so you were willing to share your story. I, I'll share. I was actually there at that performance. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, you, uh, how has the Crucible been an influence to promote your artistic work? Sure. It's um, actually, it is awesome. And it's how I actually really got into Rusty Noodle Studios. Um, the first class I took, I told you about taking the welding class with Don and Joe Brooks. Um, so supportive, so empowering, um, so empowering for me. I um, created three pieces in that class. I sold those three pieces at a consequential open house for more than the cost of the class, you know. And since then, you know, I just started making them because I had access to this equipment and I made them. And at open houses, I would sell them. And, and it kept going on. And then there was, um, which I actually helped develop too, was the gifty, the gifty open house where we sold things. And I would sell things. And it just kept going until uh, finally in 2009, I decided to open my business. I think the Crucible, to me, it's like this 360 art experience. It really is. You get inspiration. You get education you get tools, and then you also get, after all of that, exposure, you know? And you can take it to whatever degree you want, but there's, I don't know of any other place or school that offers that, you know? So it's really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And we hope that there'll be a version of Gifty back again at some point where we can make sure we feature all of our incredibly talented faculty and artists work to the community. Um, teaching has continued to play a very large role in your relationship with the Crucible. What is one of your favorite things about teaching at the Crucible? I, I think there's really two things that I really love about uh, teaching at the Crucible. And the first is, you know, what we're teaching people is just this load of information, you know, and we're just downpouring. And, you can see when someone comes into the class and they start learning, they're really a little nervous and shy and, um, and they're afraid, you know, and at some point in the class, it always happens and it happens on different levels for different students. All of a sudden, you can just see a change to an aha, aha, aha moment, you know, and they're excited and they're thrilled and they start to create something and they're just really happy to be there. Um, on more of a selfish note, it's seeing that creative process once that aha happens, you know, because you really do see how different people think 
and process things and create things. And um, it's just really fantastic. You know, it's really a fantastic feeling to see that. And it's very inspirational because you give different people the same material and they come up with something that you would never have imagined. And it really inspires you and inspires you to do better. There are so many things about the crucible that hooks people. What is it that, that you think keeps people coming back? What, what is the hook for the crucible that, you know, you're a perfect example of this. You were introduced to the crucible and you never looked back. Like, what is it about the crucible that keeps people coming back? Sure. I, for me, I think it's definitely the instructors. I mean, you have this awesome space to start with, but these instructors, our instructors, are just so awesome. I, I, I talk about my own experience. It was Joe and Don, you know, but I think, you know, I've read, being the program director, I've read so many reviews and students just fall in love with their instructors. And they're so confident in the programming, actually, that they come back from just multiple classes, you know, and they'll even go to different teachers. And it's funny because I've been in classes and, and they talk and they compare instructors and one will be saying, and if they've taken classes together, they really, this was their favorite and something, oh, no, 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 this one was the best, you know, and it's just fun to hear, you know, and it's, it's hard to beat, um, I think, the faculty at the Crucible. So completely true. There are no people like Crucible faculty. They are so talented and so passionate and dedicated, and we are truly lucky to get to experience their artistic vision and, and amazingness. Um, so we are in an interesting time right now, and we have been in this for 12 weeks, our shelter in place, um, as we start to kind of lift out of it in the Bay Area, but um, we're kind of in our new reality now. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your creative process during shelter in place? How has creating in quarantine been for you? Um, well, it, it's been a little more difficult than, um, you know, my pieces, again, um, they make me smile when I make them. So that helps. Um, but um, I'm, I'm pretty isolated here. My father's here, you know, I'm 89 years old. And so there isn't a lot of um, inspiration happening now for me um, from seeing other people. Um, I'm limited on the tools I have, uh, you know, and my father has a full workshop of wood tools um, and I do have welders here and stuff like that, but I don't have um, oxyacetylene. So, and, and the great horizontal band saws and uh, different tools we have at the Crucible. So um, that has made it a little bit more difficult, you know, for me to kind of, uh, to, to be inspired. And of course, I've been three months, so all the time that uh, this, stay in place has been going on. I've been in Milwaukee and um, it's been hard to be away from my other half. Well, we're glad that you could join us even from a couple of thousand miles away and hope that you'll be back very, very soon. It sounds like you will be pretty quick. Might you have any suggestions for artists out there who are feeling stuck or distracted in their practice during this time? Sure. Well, for me, um, I, and I do, I get very, um, it's mostly about not having um, the output of going to the shows and getting rid of pieces that I've created. Um, so I've been really taking time with walks. So, and, and it's really helped me kind of clear my head. I try to get away from all the dirt of the world uh, as far away as possible um, with what's going on. And I, I've been going for 10 to 20 mile walks a day um, and just really concentrating on trying to be present in the place I'm at, you know, seeing the trees, seeing the birds, seeing the architecture of the city, you know, um, and Milwaukee's changed quite a bit since uh, I, I, I was originally here. So it's really been kind of a, a, a new experience for me. Um, 
ultimately, I always get back to um, some of the, the garbage kind of polluting my mind, but getting away from it helps kind of clear my mind. And sometimes I'll come back and have a brand new idea on a piece of metal that's been sitting here uh, to kind of pound out. Um, getting your feet moving to, to getting your artistic nature moving, I guess. Um, exactly. What has been a surprising discovery during this time of shelter in place for you? Sure, sure. Um, I think uh, the big thing for me is the virtual art shows, which I'm just starting to kind of get into. Um, I've had over nine shows cancel, um, and this is my uh, sole uh, income now, so it's really hard uh, for me. So. Uh, virtual art shows are springing up all over and there's all different price points and everything. And um, I'm with a group now called Amdira Productions, which does, does a lot of shows in Chicago and the Milwaukee area. And I actually have one starting tomorrow. Um, and uh, it really is kind of this opportunity, I think, uh, to get my artwork out there and get it seen and hopefully um, uh, have some people come and buy from me. Again, it's been a struggle just because I don't have that input, you know. It's also, it's funny because uh, I'm a metal artist who's now become a photographer <laughs> who's doing all this other stuff trying to kind of get my stuff out there, which is, is, is difficult, but uh, it's been a challenge. And even if I don't sell anything, uh, the, the show actually lasts for, um, seven days straight it goes and um, uh, hopefully uh, I'll get something but if I don't I've learned quite a lot <laughs> about what, what you're wearing many hats um, uh, Natasha very kindly added the information about Rob's show his virtual art show that starts tomorrow into our chat box so grab that um, we are about to shift into some of your questions your audience questions if you have more questions that you'd like me to read aloud for Rob please feel free to pop them in the chat. And um, while we're kind of making that shift over to the audience q and I just wanted to remind people that if you're not already following Rob's work, um, you can check him out on Instagram at Rusty Noodle Studios, and you can find his website, RustyNoodleStudios.com. Uh, Natasha is very kindly adding that information into the chat as well. Uh, you can find him just by searching Rusty Noodle Studios. That's his uh, artistic handle. So um, we've got a couple questions that our audience has posed for us today. And if you've got more questions, add them into the chat and we'll read them out loud. Um, so we have a question uh, about reclaim your reclaimed materials. Do you keep a large inventory with you or do you keep a small inventory and you kind of make with what you've got? Um, I have quite quite a large inventory actually. I, um, it's, it's funny when you're using reclaimed items, you really need to have a lot of everything. Um, uh, I do have a studio at the Crucible that's full of, um, full of materials. And here in my father's, his garage and his workshop actually has been taken over by a lot of my materials. Um, when I got here, I actually was gonna run off to the dump and pick up some more, you know, and in uh, California, I go to Cass, Cass uh, Metals, and they actually provide me with a lot of materials. But here in Milwaukee, I, I go to this little place and I showed up, I called them, they said they were open, I showed up and they said, we just closed. We'll be open again on Monday. I went back on Monday and they said, we're, we're still closed indefinitely. And so it's kind of a little bit of a struggle when you, you don't have the materials you kind of think of. And a lot of times, you know, I'll run out and get stuff. In California, I have plenty of things kind of to keep me going. Um, so, but here in Milwaukee, it's a little more limited because it's my father's garage and, <laughs> and his workshop. How do you determine the scale or size of your pieces? Is it based on the materials that are available do you start off with an approximate size in mind? And does that evolve with the piece? Um, it definitely does what I find, you know? So um, I, um, 
it's based pretty much on what I find. I, I do, you know, it's funny, like lately, it's, uh, I, I love to do big. And so, um, so I, I, but, but the problem is you sell comparatively to the large ones, a lot smaller pieces. So um, I tend to, I tend to always get off on one end of the scale or another, all of a sudden, you know, I'll have five big pieces and I'll sell all five. And, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't even matter because I find this piece of metal and I'm like, oh my God, I got to make this. And it ends up being, you know, seven feet tall, um, like a piece I have sitting over here, you know, and it's like out of nothing, uh, all of a sudden I'm up to this huge piece. And, and it just, for me, it's kind of, it's, it's harder to kind of say, okay, it's going to be this high, you know, because I'm looking for these pieces and it just changes with whatever I find. Another question from our audience. Um, what kind of dancing styles do you do and which are your favorite? Sure. Um, so <laughs> currently, <laughs> I don't do a lot of dancing, but um, I think jazz was always one of my favorites. Um, uh, modern, I love modern um, work too. Um, ballet, I'm not crazy about, I, you know, I. I, I fell in love with one of my instructors, you know, and I pretty young, Christina. Uh, and I, I fell in love with her because she was just stricter than anything, you know, and I, she was just wonderful. And um, I remember her kind of, uh, you know, so I would love to dance. I love dancing with her. Like one time she just ran across the room and jumped into the air. And if I didn't catch her, she was gonna fall, you know, she <laughs> practically <laughs> dived over my head. Um, I, I do like modern, but there's so many different forms of modern. It kind of depends on uh, where it's coming from. It's really important for me and dance um, is focus. Um, and I think one of the companies I was with, I felt lacked that a little bit and intention of movement. And I, I try to get that in my pieces too. What is, what is happening here, you know? And, if there is no focus, it's really hard to kind of determine it. And um, I had an instructor who said, it doesn't matter, I'm making art, you know? And I'm like, well, if no one's gonna watch it, it does matter, you know? And, and, um, and I was with a, this, the same company for quite a few years and um, I love performing and I, I love getting out on stage and doing it, but the rehearsals were just grinding because I'd have to pull this information for myself and you know sometimes uh you know she would be combining uh poetry with um, um movement that really didn't correspond and there was no reason to do it you know so and and she would tell us that you know i'm making art you know so well, we've got a, a couple more um questions from our audience and then we'll start to wrap up um so are you still located in your Oakland studio or temporarily in Milwaukee? Um, well, I have my studio, of course, which is in the crucible. Uh, but unfortunately, right now, because of COVID-19, um, we can't really use the space. So that makes it difficult. So, And that's why one of the big reasons I've stayed here is so I can continue to work. Um, and before COVID, um, about how many shows did you travel to every year? Sure. Um, so I just left the Crucible in 2018. Um, and that year, I think I did 23 shows. And in, um, in 2019, I did 36 shows. So a lot. Not a lot, yeah. Just a, just a few hundred thousand miles of travel time. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, we hope that um, your virtual shows go really, really well. Uh, definitely check out Rob's show that is beginning tomorrow. The information is in the chat box, and you can follow him on Instagram at Rusty Noodle Studios or his website, RustyNoodleStudios.com. Definitely check out Rob's work. It is extraordinary. Um, we are gonna start our wrap up for the afternoon, but if you'd like to stay on, um, once we're done wrapping up, you are welcome
welcome to say a quick hello to Rob if you'd like uh, once our official talk is over. Um, but for now, I'd love to thank Rob Nering. You were an incredible guest for our virtual artist talk today. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you to all of our guests who joined us on this Friday afternoon. We are grateful for your continued uh, support and viewership as we do these virtual artist talks. Um, definitely check out thecrucible.org for all of our updated information about what's coming up for our youth summer programs, for adult programming, as well as to see the new swag that we've got at the Crucible. We've got some amazing sweatshirts, t-shirts, and beautifully uh, indigo and shibori dyed masks. Natasha is showing off her Crucible sweatshirt right now, if you can see Natasha. A couple of our amazing artists from our community have made some hand-sewn uh, and indigo dyed uh, masks that are gorgeous, so definitely check those out. Um, and you can rep some Crucible swag yourself. Um, you can support the Crucible by making a donation, joining as a member, giving or providing a gift certificate, or just following us and sharing information about the Crucible. Um, we appreciate all of your support um, as we continue to make our way towards relaunching operations very, very soon. Um, and we have, of course, a ton of absolutely extraordinary uh, artwork by our faculty and artist community on our website. You can support our Crucible artists directly by buying art from them. They are extraordinarily talented. Their pieces will brighten up any day. Um, so definitely check out all of their work at thecrucible.org. With that, I'd love to wrap up and give a big thank you and shout out to our Crucible faculty and staff who are the reason that we do everything that we do at the Crucible. Um, and I'm going to join all of us together in saying one more thank you, Rob, for being our special guest today. <laughs>